Hi, I'm Lindsay Cowell, and I'm going to talk to you today about women's suffrage. There are five women that are the center of women's suffrage. Without them, we may not have the right to vote today. Women's suffrage began about uh, 1820s. The women of the 1800s were supposed to be seen and not heard. They were supposed to be what co historians called true women, submissive and mothers concerned with home and family. The women that fought for women's suffrage were supposed to be obedient, but they were in no way could they ever be obedient. They were strong-willed, smart leaders that fought for the right and life that women now know. These women were also lonely. They wanted to be involved in more than just the running of their houses and taking care of their families. We need to remember where we came from, how hard it was for these women just a few years ago. Seems like a long time ago, but it really was only just a few years ago. I chose this topic because I needed to be reminded as well. I have always been intrigued by women's suffrage. One morning I came across a movie called um, Iron Jawed Angels uh, portraying Alice Paul. I went on to find many journal entries and actually the 19th Amendment approving women to vote. There are five women that are an intricate part of the beginning of women's suffrage. The first one is Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Elizabeth Mott, Jane Hunt, Martha Coffin Wright, and Mary Ann McClintock. Let's begin with how these five women met. It took until the end of the Civil War for the government to start questioning the suffrage and citizenship of women. After the government granted slaves their freedom and the right to vote, they started seeing what the women needed. It took a long time for the government to see that women needed the same rights as the slaves, such as education, ownership of land, and the right to vote. First, we start with, once again, how they met. There are so many great women, but there's just a, the first few to actively support suffragists that helped um, start it all. They not only fought for women, but for slavery as well. The first major place they gathered was in Seneca Falls, New York, to discuss women's rights. The leaders of this gathering were Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott. This meeting started out as a tea party. A group of well-behaved women having tea with June Hunt. June Hunt invited four women. These women were, once again, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia Mott, and her sister, Martha Wright, and Mary Ann McClintock. During this meeting, life as women knew it would change forever. Elizabeth and Lucretia's first meeting, they met at the World Anti-Slavery Convention. When they got there, they were told they had to stand behind a barrier. They were not allowed to voice any of their opinions, and they were not allowed to vote for anything. When Elizabeth and Lucretia headed home, after this meeting, they vowed to have a meeting to advocate for the rights of women. When Elizabeth and Lucretia met June Hunt, Elizabeth and Lucretia met June through Lucretia Quaker's families. These Quaker women were angry over the way women were treated. June Hunt was the sister of Martha Wright and knew Mary Ann McClintock through her Quaker families. Quakers were raised to believe that women were a man's equal, not his property. Women were sent to school and educated just as men were. Now that we've learned how they met, let's learn a little bit about them. Elizabeth Cady Stanton was born in 1815. She died in 1832. She was born to a wealthy family who owned slaves. The father was a lawyer educated to, um, I'm sorry, elected to one term in office and a judge for many years. She also had a brother who died at a very young age and then she became the boy that her father wanted. She learned how to ride, learned Greek. 
She would spend many hours listening to her father's many clients complain about the injustice of women. She would leave her husband and children for uh, behind for long periods of time so that she could fight for what was right. Lucretia Mott was born in 1793. She died in 1880. She was raised as a Quaker, taught to believe that men and women were equal in the eyes of God. She went to a boarding school in Boston was an assistant teacher, became a preacher in the 20s, and founded the Philadelphia Female Anti-Slavery Society. Jane Hunt was born in 1812, died in 1889, raised as a Quaker. Husband encouraged her to live as an equal. Husband suggested she have this tea party. Martha Coffin Wright, born 1806, died 1875. Sister to Lucretia Mott, she was raised as a Quaker, first fell in love with a man that was not a Quaker, married him anyway, and then uh, the Quakers refused to recognize her marriage. She became frustrated over the restrictions. Mary Ann McClintock was born in 1800, died in 1884, raised as a Quaker again. Husband and Mary together owned a drugstore. In this drugstore, they refused to sell items made by slave labor or circulate into any anti-slavery petitions. Invited fugitive slaves into their homes as a station of the Underground Railroad. Inevitably, she would then start fighting for the cause of women's rights. The day of the tea party, as all women do, they talked about their issues as women, babies, husbands, what happened at the local supermarket, how this man treated her, education, voting, owning a property. They wrote the advertisement to the local newspaper, Women's Rights Convention, a convention to discuss the social, civil, and religious conditions and rights of women, will be held in the chapel at the Seneca Falls, New York, on Wednesday and Thursday, the 19th and 20th of July, Currents commencing at 10 a.m. during the first day, the meeting will be exclusively for women who are earnestly invited to attend. The public generally are invited to be present on the second day when Lucretia Mott and, uh, of Philadelphia and other ladies and gentlemen will address the convention. After the Tea Party and the creation of the convention, Mary Ann McClintock hosted the planning party at her house. McClintock, two daughters, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton wrote the Declaration of Sentiments. It kind of looks like the Declaration of Independence written by Thomas Jefferson. The convention drew in hundreds of attendees, remembered as the spark that kindled the American movement. Declaration of Sentiments ratified the second day of the convention. It was signed by 68 women and 32 men. Elizabeth Cady Stanton read it on the first day. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. After the convention, many of the women went on to have their own meetings in their areas. In 1850, the first National Women's Rights Convention was held and attracted more than 1,000 attendants. In the end, these women did not see the passing of the Amendment 19, giving women the right to vote, but we would not be here if, we, um, if it were not for these women. To this day, there are so many women that live up to the challenge of being the woman, the, the same type of woman that these women were. I just hope that I am able to make them proud wherever they are looking down at us. Thank you very much. This is my bibliography. And I did get a copy of the amendment 19. And here's a couple of pictures of the women.